we're going live now. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for another e-shadowing session. I hope you guys are excited to learn more about different fields in medicine. And it, was, it is with pleasure that I introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Ami Shah. She's a doctor specializing in ophthalmology. And today she will be sharing about her journey to medicine and her specialty. And just as a reminder, towards the end of the session, we will be posting a Google form link in the chat for you to take the assessment. You can pass with a minimum of 70% to receive your credit for this session. And with that being said, Dr. Shah, you're welcome to start whenever you're ready. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Super excited to share a little light on a, on a field that's probably not even um, that well exposed, even in med school. So, you know, pre-medically, probably, you know, it's even smaller of a field. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about ophthalmology and kind of how I got here and why I chose it. Um, so, you know, originally, you know, why do we all wanna go into medicine? It's really, we wanna, we wanna help people. We wanna do something that we're passionate about. Um, I've always been passionate about technology and engineering and using technology to, you know, better our life. And so ophthalmology is a great fit in that because it uses a lot of different technology and a lot of different, um, it's always kind of new tools and gadgets that are, that are in on it. Um, so I, so with that, you know, I did undergrad at Illinois Institute of Technology and Engineering. Um, so I was a, uh, a, a MBB, which is my molecular biochemistry and biophysics. Um, I also played soccer in college. Um, and so it was kind of one of the, the fun things that got to do with undergrad. And then continued with, with, uh, in Chicago at medical school at, uh, Chicago Med School at Rosalind Franklin University, um, up in North Chicago. It was kind of interesting. You're up in North Chicago for a couple of years for the basic sciences. And then we moved downtown to do all our clinical rotations. So that was fun because got to rotate through like Cook County and all the crazy uh, hospitals down there. So residency, um, I'm originally from Arizona. So I went back to Arizona for, for residency in ophthalmology. Um, ophthalmology is a four-year residency. It's a year of internship. Um, I did a year of internal medicine in Phoenix and then three years of ophthalmology at U of A. And then ophthalmology, you know, we take, it's, it's kind of funny, you take the world's smallest organ, your eye, and you can divvy it up into even smaller parts and, and specialize in even the smallest parts. So people can specialize in the cornea, which is the front part of the eye. They can specialize in the retina, which is the back part of the eye. They can specialize in glaucoma, which is one specific disease of the eye. Um, there's also oculoplastics, which is basically plastic surgery of the upper face. And then there's neuro-ophthalmology. Um, which is you know, uh, looking more into the connection of the eye with the brain, so more of the optic nerve. So I did fellowship, uh, combined fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology and oculoplastics um, at Ohio State. It was a two-year fellowship and then moved out to Austin to practice. So ophthalmology, you know, what it is, it's, it's, it's eye and vision care. Um, it differentiates between optometry and that it includes surgery. And so, like I was saying, you know, you can, you can subspecialize. You can take, we took the eye and divvied it up into the world's smallest parts. And um, you can specialize in even, even a smaller part than the eye. Um, they're still general ophthalmologists and their bread and butter is probably just cataract surgery. Um, it's mostly the cornea specialists that do, like everyone here is about LASIK. Um, so not every ophthalmologist can do LASIK or, you know, laser eye surgery. Those are usually the cornea specialists um, that you see kind of running around on TV. Uh, talking about that. So the day of life of, of, of me, um, so my clinic is half and half between neuro-ophthalmology and oculoplastics. And so my patients range from those who have had strokes, who have had other vision problems, you know, sudden vision loss, double vision, um, you know, things like that, kind of, you know, the connection between the eye and the brain. And then, you know, the, these problems aren't kind of stemming exactly from their eye. There's no pathology that you can see on their eye that's causing it. Um, that's, that's the neuro-ophthalmology realm of it. Oculoplastics, that can be cosmetic. It can be just, you know, a cosmetic patient looking for a lid lift. But they're also, you know, post-trauma, um, a lot of orbital fractures, um, and then, you know, tearing, people with excessive tearing. Um, but I would say majority of it, it probably is more cosmetic, but I actually, you know, do a lot of more functional things as well with it. And so this is, um, the case presentation I have today is actually probably the, the, the best, 
um, mixture of a, of a neuro ophthalmology and aquaplastics patient. Um, so this is a patient, you know, she's a, you know, 55 year old female, um, who you can see, you know, presented basic, com basically complaining of irritation and foreign body sensation of her eyes. And so you look at her and, you know, what you notice initially is her eyes are a little bit more protruded. Her upper eyelids are more retracted further back. And she also complains of a little bit of double vision, um, intermittently. So she has a past medical history of Graves' disease or thyroid disease. Um, you know, that's been treated. So now things have plateaued on that realm. Um, and she comes in, you know, basically asking for what else that she can do. And so this is a patient that, you know, it's, it's pretty, it, 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 it gels um, that, that neuro and neurooculoplastics realm. You know, so thyroid eye disease in itself it can be when a person's hyper, hypo, or, you know, or euthyroid, which is when you have normal thyroid function. And what happens is the thyroid um, develops these antibodies and it causes basically fatty uptake and increase in the fatty content of the tissues around the eyes. And it can cause enlargement of the extraocular muscles. So the most common thing that you see is what we call proptosis or exophthalmos where their eyes become more bulgy because what happens is as things increase in the socket, which is the bony socket of the eye, you know, the volume increases and the eyes have nowhere to go. So they take the path of least resistance and they basically come forward. So that causes the exophthalmos. You know, the other symptoms of hypothyroidism, um, this is kind of where, you know, it, it, the, the general medical knowledge also, also helps is just kind of, you know, being able to sometimes patients present with this. They don't, they don't know anything else is going on. They come to the eye, you know, to the eye doc saying, uh, my eyes look weird or my eyes look bulgy or, you know, someone said my right eye looks bigger than my left eye. And they, you know, are complaining of some of these other systemic um, symptoms that are worth, uh, with, uh, worth uh, make sure you, you, you review. Um, their complaints always, you know, usually, you know, tend to stem from when there's this exposure. So the exposure of the eyes can cause dryness because now more of the eyes exposed to the air, you get the dryness and that can cause kind of little bumps in the cornea, which cause blurred vision, the discomfort, um, light sensitivity because the light's kind of hitting this rocky surface now, or this bumpy surface. Um, it can cause excess of tearing because your body, you know, your eyes, you know, are saying my eyes are dry. So the body kind of hits its reflex and hits it with tears. Um, and then it causes double vision in the sense where those extraocular muscles get enlarged. And so your eyes can't work well together. They don't track well together. So when you're looking side to side or when you're looking straight ahead, that equal push pull that your eye should have is no longer there. And so there's kind of that, that, that misalignment causing double vision. And so there's always, you know, these little signs that you can see with swelling in the upper and lower lid. You can see redness. Um, you can see some, uh, and then sometimes even you can see the fat prolapse through through the sides of the eyes. Oh, sorry. sorry. <clears throat> so proptosis, you know, it's measured. We use this little handy dandy ruler called a hertel. Um, there are, um, you know, the typical guidelines that we use of, of 21 millimeters, um, making someone proptotic. But then, you know, racially and culturally, we all have we all have differences. Um, you know, African Americans tend to have just more prominent eyes, and so they tend to, you know, their their cutoffs are a little bit higher than um, Caucasians, and so um, that's just one thing to keep in mind when you're when we're looking at that. And then, like I said, the the eye muscles can get enlarged, and it's very asymmetric in how they how they enlarge. Um, and so, what you see is this misalignment when someone's looking even straight ahead, and even more so when they're trying to look side to side. Because the larger the muscle is, it's stronger. And so it pulls the eye in that direction and doesn't allow the eye to move in its opposite direction as well. So the most common muscle to be involved in is the inferior rectus. So what happens is it push, pulls the eye down. And so as you try to look up, you have this kind of major force pulling the eye down. So the person's not able to look up as much. Um, this also causes a change in the interocular pressure um, which sometimes you can test, which doesn't really change much, but it's just kind of an interesting like tidbit. Um, with double vision, 
Another thing that makes things a little trickier is, um, you know, thyroiditis disease or Graves' disease can sometimes be an autoimmune issue. And, and when you have an autoimmune issue, you can get other autoimmune issues. So um, it's it, not very common, but about one to 5% of patients with thyroid eye disease will also have myasthenia gravis. And myasthenia gravis is a systemic um, autoimmune disease that can also cause double vision. And so, you know, it's important to kind of discuss with the patient and when you're taking your measurements, just to look, because the myasthenia gravis, you know, it, it tends to fluctuate. Um, it's more prominent when, when they're tired um, and, you know, in different gazes, things will be what's called incompetent. Um, and it can also cause a ptosis, which is a lid droop versus um, the lid retraction. Sometimes they can get masks because if they have severe thyroid eye disease, they have lid retraction that's so severe that that ptosis you can't really see because um, the retraction is so severe. So like we're talking about um, exposure keratitis, which is that dryness, which is exposure of the front of the eye. Um, not only is this uncomfortable and irritating to the patient and you know, uh, cosmetically not appealing because their eyes look red and irritated all the time, um, it can lead to permanent vision loss. Um, you know, the more the eyes exposed, the more it dries out, the cornea can ulcerate, it can become thinner and it can perforate, um, which causes uh, permanent vision loss and even, you know, potentially loss of the eye. And so um, initially when it starts, sometimes it's just irritating and, and, and cosmetically unappealing, but it's pretty important to aggressively treat um, to avoid those um, those pretty uh, severe um, permanent uh, effects. The other thing that can cause um, uh, permanent vision loss is, is, is what's called compressive optic neuropathy. Um, and this tends to happen in patients in the active phase. You know, when their thyroid eye disease takes on, it's, it's active while the patients are still trying to get their thyroid under control. And then it goes into what's called a plateau phase after, you know, the thyroid function is normalized. Um, their tissues can fibrose and scar. So it goes into this plateau phase um, of that. So the compressive optic neuropathy, we tend to see more in the, in the active phase. And what happens is the eyeball itself, like we said, it's in a bony house. There's a roof, floor, two side walls, and it's an enclosed area. So as the muscles get enlarged, the muscles all exit through the back of the orbit and the orbit's kind of pear-shaped. And so it's the narrowest at the back, which is also where the optic nerve exits um, on its course to the brain. And so if you think about these muscles enlarging and enlarging, they can actually start to push on the optic nerve, which can cause vision loss. And so what we see is you see, when you look in the back of the eye, we're looking at the tip of the optic nerve with all the vessels coming out. And on this side, this is a normal optic nerve with nice crisp margins. Um, you can see all of those. And on this, what you can see is it's kind of blurred and some of those vessels have become hazy. So this is optic nerve swelling or edema which comes from compression. And if you look at the CT, you can see that these are the enlarged extraocular muscles. In this coronal scan, it's a little bit easier. Um, you can see you know, four of the extraocular muscles, which are quite enlarged on both sides, um, obviously more so on here. And that's what's causing the compression because you see, you see the optic nerve kind of leaving, uh, you know, coursing from the eye back to the brain. And you see these extraocular muscles that are that are quite enlarged, um, starting to push on that on that nerve. And so, you know, we talked about the um, the, the the you know active and then the plateau phase. And so, it usually tends to be about one to three years from the onset of the disease for it to go through the active phase to hit our plateau. And you really want to do surgery once things have plateaued. Otherwise, you're chasing your tail. Um, you know, trying to reverse things because if you do a surgery to help the bulgingness of the eye, but they're still active, they're just going to continue to bulge. And then, you know, what you did three months before um, would have been useless and, you know, more risk than benefit. Um, the exposure, the exceptions, of course, are if they're at risk of permanent vision loss. So if their exposure keratopathy is so bad that they're going to risk permanent vision loss, or if they have that compressive optic neuropathy. So, low, you know, you know, conservatively in the beginning when they're active, you want to treat just with lubrication, taping their lids, um, doing anything to kind of keep their eyes closed, even just temporarily with a tarsorophy, which is a quick stitch, um, doing things to kind of help 
just alleviate their symptoms. Steroids um, are often used as IV steroids um, in the active phase because they kind of help with the, the you know immune suppression. But you know that being said, they're they don't help a lot with the proptosis or the exophthalmos or the double vision. And, and, the, and steroids in themselves in these high doses come with their own, you know, bout of side effects. So they're used uh, very sparingly and if you absolutely have to. Um, there's other immunosuppressive therapy that's used, but not very commonly. Orbital radiation um, used to be used a lot more. Um, it tends in the active phase, if you catch thyroid disease in the active phase, it tends to reverse some of the effects. Um, it, it takes a lot of treatment. There's not a lot of places that do just solely orbital radiation anymore. And kind of like steroids, radiation itself can come with a lot of other side effects too. It can be damaging to the optic nerve as well. So it's not used um, as often. The newest thing that um, just came out, um, that's probably going to be the best thing for thyroid eye disease is Tepeza. Um, so this is uh, FDA approved last February. So it's been a year. Um, and it's an IV infusion. And it's probably the only medication that we have that actually reverses the effects of thyroid eye disease um, well. And the studies have been incredible on how much it, it reduces the proptosis and the double vision. Actually, um, they've shown the reduction in the extraocular muscle size. Um, and it's interesting because it's not a steroid, you know, it's a, it's an, it's a monoclonal antibody. And it's um, it, it's it's pretty well covered by insurance, surprisingly, and so it's uh, and the main side effects of it have been pretty tolerable. You know, the main thing was hyperglycemia, which um, was only while they were getting their infusion, um, and then it pretty much reversed as long as you're monitoring that it was fine. Um, and so this is pretty promising because it's one of the first meds that we actually have to use during active thyroid eye disease instead of just saying you know lubricate your eyes, lubricate your eyes, we'll get to you. Hopefully in three years, once things stabilize, um, we actually have something now to offer um, patients that shows promise. The other good thing about Tepeza is um, there have been some good studies that are, that are starting to show that it works in chronic patients too. So even patients who are out of the active phase where previously the only thing we had to reverse the effects of thyroid disease was surgery. Now we have a medication we can offer, which obviously conservatively is better because patients don't have to go through the risk of surgery. They don't have to go through as many surgeries um, or even as aggressive a surgery, uh, even if they still need surgery. So the, if patients get to the surgical management, um, you know, it's, it's always staged. It's going to be multiple um, surgeries. Um, you know, the first step is getting their, getting their proptosis um, improved. And so, you know, creating more space in that bony socket, which is an orbital decompression, basically kind of bur you know, burring away, chipping away bone, either from the lateral wall or the floor to create more space for the eyeball to go back in. You do this first because that can change your eye muscle position or your lip position. After that, um, if they need eye muscle surgery to kind of realign their eyes so they can see, you know, see single, um, that's done. And then lastly, is we do lid surgery, if you still need just that better closure, um, if their lids are still pretty far up um, and retracted from that muscle getting pulled. So an orbital decompression, um, kind of like, this is the, the, the uh, you know, kind of a schematic of the orbit. And so doing the, you know, the, the lateral orbital wall, um, it tends to give you the most decompression. You can also do the floor of the orbit um, to get to get some as well. Um, strabismus surgery, and so that's, you know, moving the eye muscles. And again, that also um, is staged because, you know, there's six muscles that move around our eyes, and you don't want to do surgery on more than two, two to three muscles at a time because you can risk changing the blood supply to the eye if you do surgery on more muscles, um, which can lead to vision loss. And so ten, it tends to be the, you know, one to two surgeries to really get um, their, their eyes align. And the goal is, you know, um, single vision when they're looking straight ahead and, and down, because that's how we spend most of our life. Um, you're not changing the eye muscle size, we're moving its position. And so when patients look right, left, up, down, they'll still see double, but 
you know, we tend to stand, spend most of our time looking straight ahead and we have to, and you know, with these patients, you tell them you just have to, we have to adapt to turning your head to look to the right versus just looking to the right. And so, you know, this is like a gentleman who you can see that inferior rectus on this side was very strong, get pulling that eye down when he's looking straight ahead. And on this side, it's the, the superior rectus, which is very strong, pulling the eye up. And so by weakening or loosening the inferior rectus on this side, you can bring the eye up. And then by loosening or weakening the superior rectus on this side, you can bring the eye down. So in primary gaze, he's looking straight ahead. Um, eyelid surgery works with just kind of lowering the eyelids as much as needed. Um, so as far, you know, as far back as they are, you kind of loosen those muscles. Um, and typically it's the levator um, aponeurosis that becomes fibrosed or enlarged and that pulls the eyelid up. Um, and so it's kind of releasing that scar tissue and recessing that to bring the eyelid down. And so you can do the upper lids. You can see, you know, typically we don't see the, the white part or the sclera of, of our, uh, on the superior portions that's usually covered by our eyelids. And so you can see that her, her eyelids are quite retracted further back. Uh, by recessing it, you can bring the eyelids down back to where they should be. Um, this is just kind of a little asymmetric on one side and then bring it down to, to make it more symmetric on, on those. <coughs> so, you know, in, con in conclusion, it's, it's, it's a very common autoimmune disease. Um, you know, most people think if they don't have Graves' disease, they don't have thyroid eye disease and something, you know, may else be going on. Um, but it can be in all sorts of thyroid dysfunction. And it's really just important to, you know, keep it on a stepwise plan and just kind of, you know, make sure that you're chronically screening them because, um, you know, even in that active phase, they can lose, they can lose vision. Um, so the last piece I have is just advice for, for y'all. And probably the main thing is, you know, don't go into something that you think you have to go into, um, you know, just because you, know, you thought you liked it and, and you'd have to go into it. Um, I went to med school thinking I was going to do pediatrics and I was dead set that I was going to do peds. I mean, I was president of like a pediatric interest club, um, you know, my first year, because I thought that's what I want to do. And that's, I need to, you know, tick all these marks to get into a good pediatric residency. And then I ended up doing my surgical rotations first because people said, if you want to do peds, you want to do that in your second half. So you're well equipped on road rotations and you know what you're doing. So you don't look like a goof. Uh, and I instantly fell in love with surgery. And so my whole scheme changed, um, you know, kind of later on. And so just figure out what, you know, kind of see what you like, dive into everything before you figure out, before you say, you know, that's exactly what you want to do. Um, and the other thing is to kind of remember what you're, why you're you know, why you're doing this. Um, I think as we go through the whole process, um, you get jaded and, you know, our healthcare system needs a lot of work. And so it's easy to, to be ambitious and say what we want to do now, and then get out into the real world and just fall into the trap of the healthcare system. Um, one of the things I did is, you know, I'm, I'm five years out from fellowship and I did join big practices um, and was in that that healthcare healthcare circle that was you know just insurance based and I was a number um, you know it's based on how many patients you see they don't care how long you take with them because you need to see sixty patients in a day so they can keep their lights on they can afford to pay you which I thought was terrible it was a terrible model because um, that's not what I was doing and so I branched out and I created a direct care model. Um, to now where I see, you know, 20 patients in a day, but I can spend 45 minutes with them if I like. Um, and because I don't take insurance, um, you know, it still becomes financially feasible. Um, and so I'm still, you know, now I'm back to, you know, bringing back to what the medicine that I wanted to practice. Um, and so that's just the one thing, you know, just keep that in mind. Cause I know people who are stuck in that model and they hate it and they hate medicine. They, you know, they're saying, I'll never have my kids do medicine. Um, and that's just because they're stuck in a model they don't like. Uh, so just remember what you're doing. And that's it.
If you guys have any questions for Dr. Shaw, feel free to leave it in the chat so I can read it after. Um, but I do have some questions for Dr. Shaw. Um, I was just wondering, because like all the presentation slides that I looked at, it was very complicated. And I was like wondering if you have any like crazy stories about ophthalmology, like have you seen any crazy cases? Uh, there, um, the crazy cases always come from trauma, I think. Um, and probably the craziest one was I was a, uh, I think it was a first year resident at U of A. And so we were in Tucson, you know, which is pretty close to the, the Mexico border. So we see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, people trying to cross the border. And we had a guy who created his own um, plane, basically, like he made himself wings. I think he, he forgot to put lights on him and tried to fly over the border at night and ran smack into a cactus and came in with just, you know, like cactus needles, you know, perforating both eyes. Um, I mean, he had, he was pretty creative, but uh, it, was, it was a crazy case because we kind of were in the OR for almost six hours trying to get out every single cactus needle. That, that sounds painful. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and your journey to medicine, it seemed pretty linear to me. Do you have any tips for students who, let's say, have taken gap years or like are planning, with take, planning to take gap years in the future? Um, there, yeah, I mean, I actually, I think a gap year is awesome. Um, like I said, it's, it's part of figuring out what you like. It's gonna make you probably a better applicant, um, just in the fact that you're gonna have more to talk about. You know, everyone, has almost the same journey. I think what, what stood me out when I went, when I applied was I was an engineer. So I had very little, you know, pre-science background. I was, I was like, I wanted to be an engineer. I actually thought that's what I was going to do. And, um, and then, you know, moved on. And then I played soccer in college. And so, you know, most people ask me about like my soccer career versus, you know, the other extracurriculars that, you know, would be of a typical med student. And so, you know, a gap year to do something that's interesting to you um, or that you're passionate about, um, totally worth it because it's a long journey. And so you don't want to be, you know, out of residency at, you know, in your thirties and then finally do what you want to do because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not worth it. Okay. I have a question from Yuna. She says, um, how did you get used to doing the surgeries and what were the difficulties you encountered while performing them? Well, there's the, you know, the, the thing with surgeries is it's all, it's just, it's, it's practice. And so, you know, when you're in residency and fellowship, it's getting into as many cases as you can. Um, you know, in fellowship, obviously you're scrubbing into everyone's, but even in residency, mm -hmm. um, once I figured out that I liked oculoplastics in orbit, you know, I would ask our, um, you know, that, that attending, you know, if there were any cases, even on the weekend or in, on the evenings, um, and he didn't have another resident just to give me a call and I'd show up and scrub in. Um, and even if I just watched or just kind of, you know, uh, uh, helped a little bit, that's helpful. Um, just staying up with, with current guidelines and videos and, and it's always asking for help uh, when you need it. And in the beginning, it's, it's definitely in, you know, even, or even, you know, five years out, if there's a procedure that I have that I haven't done in a while, it's just reviewing it, watching videos. And, and at some point it, you know, you have to have the confidence that you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, any tips for students who want to do ophthalmology in the future, like any pros and cons, you know, on there. Um, I mean, I think it's a great lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're, there's typically very little emergencies in, in the opto world. And so, you know, you, you, it's like eight to five in your home, you know, mostly on the, on the weekdays. And so, um, I think the lifestyle is great. I think the, the reward's good, you know, patients value their vision. And so, um, when you can preserve that or improve it, um, they're extremely grateful, which makes, you know, your job, you know, more rewarding, um, and so those are probably the, the biggest pros. And I think the cons follow what, what everything else is in medicine is, you know, with insurance cuts, it's probably going to, a lot of the reimbursements are getting cut. Um, you know, they're cutting cataracts right and left, um, which is ridiculous because it's a way to instantly basically fix, you know, uh, patients who are going blind mm -hmm. uh, and Medicare want, continues to cut those. Um, 
And so I think that's just the biggest frustration of any ophthalmologist, but you know, I think that's, that's across the board in any, any field, they're gonna find that. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And um, any tips for students um, who are doing pre-med or like having trouble with motivation, just like how you like recover from um, imposter syndrome? On there. I think a lot of it is finding that, finding people with like-minded, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then kind of just this is like creating those groups to, to talk the room and then, you know, finding um, people to shadow even, you know, I know it's hard now with COVID, but even people to in-person shadow, um, you know, because I think the way to, to kind of fight through that is to, to you know, one, first recognize, your, recognize it's there and then two, to be like, you know, oh, these people have pushed past and they've gotten past that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question from someone in the chat. They say, I heard ophthalmology is competitive. What did you have to do in medical school to become competitive for that? Okay. It is, um, I think it gets more competitive as time goes on. Um, one of the, the main things is, is being involved as early as you can. Once you figure out you wanna do it, um, you know, research and in, in your involvement uh, in, in the field is, 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 is huge. Um, I was late to the game. I mean, when I decided I wanted to do ophthalmology, I was a third year, you know, medical student. And I think people who thought they wanted to do ophthalmology, they already knew that from first year. And so, you know, I was way behind on research or being involved. Um, but I think just even any sort of, you know, interest that you can show helped, um, you know, with our home program. And then, you know, I did an away rotation at U of A and again, was just really active and just showed how, um, interested I was. So, you know, I matched at U of A, which is my first choice. I wasn't even from, like, I wasn't in med school in Arizona. And I think the main thing that helped was during my away rotation, you know, I was always there. I was, you know, I was telling every attending, you know, I'll, I mean, I was a med student, what was I doing? Um, you know, so if they had a, if they had a case in the middle of the night or something, I was like, give me a call, I'll show up because, you know, I want to see as much as I can. And I think just that, that willingness to be involved um, and just having a, having a good attitude helped. Um, I have one question from Jocelyn. She says that she gets the occasional eye twitch when she's running low on some good dress. Um, she's asking if there's any good home remedies for that. Oh, sleep, lots and lots of sleep. sleep. Uh, the most common cause of an eye twitch is fatigue or excess caffeine. Um, so, and then they go hand in hand because when you don't sleep a lot, you drink a lot of coffee to try to stay awake. Um, and that causes the, the eye twitch a lot. So the first thing is, is getting some good rest. Yeah, I for sure get the eye twitch from caffeine. Yeah. And what's your favorite um, or like least favorite part of your job? Uh, there. Um, now I actually don't have one. Um, before it was, you know, it, would, it, it, it wasn't even their fault. But before it was, you know, patients who were pissed off and yelling at me because they waited for three hours to see me or, you know, they didn't, they didn't think I spent enough time with them. And that all stemmed from the model I had to do. Because if I didn't leave the room in 15 minutes, my office manager was, you know, yelling at me that I was spending too much time in their room. And so, you know, that, that kind of that, that business model um, was the most frustrating part of my job. Um, but now there's there's now that I don't deal with any of that um I can't find a negative part because you know I like taking care of the patients and I like seeing them and, and, and helping them in any way I can mm -hmm. um any more questions for Dr. Um, Shai um, feel free to type it in the chat and how would you say your um work-life balance is now that you have your own sort of clinic you said Oh, there, yeah. No, it's, it's great. Um, so yeah, I've, and, and part of the reason we did that too is because I have two small kids. And so, um, you know, I work, I mean, I'm always fielding calls from patients and doing a lot of the telemedicine things, but a lot of it's on my own schedule. Um, you know, I'm in clinic uh, a couple of days a week. I'm in surgery a day a week. Um, but a lot of times I can, I can move things around or, you know, I can make sure that I'm there to pick up the kids from school or do what do do what I need to do so I think that balance is a lot better mm -hmm. yeah that sounds nice 
Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Shah, for um, the very informative presentation. I'm sure everyone learned a lot from your presentation. Oh, thanks. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. I think I left, yeah, sorry, I forgot to put this up there. Um, feel free just to you know shoot me a, a message or, or anything you need. Mm -hmm. And also thank you for sharing your information online. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very grateful to have you today. Um, and yeah, for those of you who are currently attending, if you wish, wish to take the assessment, we have posted the Google form link in the chat. You will have an hour or so to complete the form after this session, and you'll have to pass with a minimum of seven out of 10 points. Please try to use one email throughout the session so that it's easy to track your hours as you continue to participate in our program. We will be providing certificates by the end of May with your total hours for spring. And our next meeting is happening on February 26th with Dr. Sarah Boyles. And she's a first physician in, uh, sorry, Eurogynecology. And again, we'd like to thank you all for joining in. Take care and have a nice day. <laughs>